Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Uh, this is the Naughty Naughty in Conversation, and today I would like to welcome back HG Tudor. Hello, HG. Hello, Harry. HG Tudor is the world-renowned authority on narcissism and the prolific author of more than 50 books and 200 programs. He has written hundreds of articles and created over a thousand videos. HG Tudor writes from his own perspective as a diagnosed narcissist, psych, narcissistic psychopath and delivers extensive knowledge on every aspect of dealing with a narcissist. Through his insightful lens, you will learn the true mindset, behaviors, and aims of the narcissist. Myths and false hopes will be extinguished and replaced with pure logic defenses. You will learn your role in each type of relationship with a narcissist and find detailed information on how you can best prepare to deal with and escape from narcissistic abuse. Knowledge is power, and with each book you read and each logic bulletin you digest, you will at last have the answers you seek and will become empowered with information you cannot obtain anywhere else. Fantastic. So today, HG and I are going to uh, discuss uh, the differences and perhaps even similarities of uh the autistic experience and the narcissist's experience. So some of you will have tuned in to my live yesterday evening where I asked you what topics might be useful for HG and I to discuss. And I thought first and foremost, we will discuss empathy, right? So now autistic people are often described as not having empathy, which we know is not true. And I know from HG's work, you uh, make a distinction between emotional and cognitive empathy. Uh -huh. um, now let's think, um, from my own personal experience and uh, from my experience in working with autistic people, sometimes we might say something or not quite get something. And then the moment people tell us that the comment we made was hurtful, oh no, oh damn, that's when it might kick in, right? The emotional empathy. So I can think about, I've got a reputation for being quite blunt um, and to the point. And sometimes people might say, actually, Harry, that was quite hurtful. And at that point, um, I start to feel uh, remorseful. I start to feel uh, regret. I start to feel guilty and bad, right? And a, an example I often use is um, a, a young autistic girl I used to know who was at the zoo one day. Was it a zoo or the farm? I think it was a farm, actually. And there was a person working at the farm who was talking about what a cold day it was. And the little girl said, responded to the woman, you'll be okay, though, because your fat will keep you warm right? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't coming from a place of, I don't like that person, and therefore they deserve an insult. It was just innocently expressed. And with that particular person, all you had to do was point out the potentially hurtful nature of being that direct. And then, as I said before, the guilt, um, uh, the guilt uh, steps in. Mm -hmm. So, what do you make of that, HG? You initially could have a similarity that would be quite difficult to distinguish between a particular type of narcissist and an autistic individual that would make that remark because lesser narcissists that don't have any emotional empathy and don't have cognitive empathy could well say to somebody, don't worry, you'll be okay because you're a fatty in the same way that that girl said. However, so that, at that juncture, distinguishing between the two would be rather difficult because both are blunt, direct, and to the point. However, thereafter, as you've made the valid observation, that when it's pointed out to the little girl, you ought not to have said that, then there's a kind of, oh, sorry, and there's a reaction. And, oh, really, uh, a comprehension of, oh, is that not quite right? 
If you were to say that to a lesser narcissist, you ought not to have said that. You're, of course, challenging them further. You're issuing what I call challenge fuel. Mm -hmm. You're giving them an emotional response, but you're telling them what that they've said is wrong. Now, because they don't often with, operate with the facade and don't have cognitive empathy, they will not do this. Oh, sorry, shouldn't have said that, should I? Ever so sorry. They likely go, yeah, but it's effing true. She is fat and will most likely repeat the insult or say, what's it got to do sticking your nose? You? Why are you sticking your nose in? I was just commenting. Uh, I'm just stating a fact. It's cold, but she'll be OK because she's fat. What business of it is yours? And then they will attack the person that's intervened to say you shouldn't say that. So you'll notice a difference thereafter. So there will be certain instances where there will be a difficulty in distinguishing between the two. But you have to give it a little bit of time and watch the interaction further. And then you can make a distinction, as I've just explained. Right. OK. Um, and I have heard you talk about before how it's almost impossible to just determine whether someone is a narcissist by just one behavior alone you have to look at the absolutely one. right harry yeah. i make that i make that abundantly clear so often people say hg this person i'm with talks about himself all the time is he a narcissist and i say you can't make a determination of that it's an indicator no nothing more you must look at a range of behaviors over a sustained period of time to see if there are more and more indicators to then make a determination so you're right about that. Sure. And it would be the same um, as far as autistic people are concerned. You may yeah. have a particularly blunt and direct uh, person, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're autistic because you'd have to look at um, special interests. You'd have to look at um, uh, repetitive behaviours. You would have to look at mm -hmm. you know, sensory uh, profiles and other things. So, yes, that's right. You, you uh, Just going back to that example, uh, where the little girl's challenged, her response is not one of immediate knee-jerk reaction to quash the challenge. She's open to the challenge. So, for instance, with people with autism, you can say no to them, and they won't get shirty about it. You do that to a narcissist. We do not like to be told no, and you'll see some form of reaction. With a lesser narcissist, you may well see the ignition of fury, and you'll get a vitriolic response with the mid-range narcissist that might start sulking with you, possibly turn into a pity play, possibly turn on a bit of a charm, charm with you. They're more evolved. So a, a distinction is if you, you can say no to a person with autism without you then getting a response that nullifies that threat to control. Um, it's also my experience that you don't tend to find autistic people who, who go in for pity plays. They don't just sit there uh, doing a pity play, whereas... The narcissist, particularly mid-range narcissist, as per my classification, regularly engage in pity plays, essentially feeling sorry for themselves and exhibiting envy in regard of other people, sitting there, turning on the waterworks, talking about how unfair life is, etc. So there's another distinction there. Yeah, and I suppose whilst we're on the topic of um, directness as well, and we'll move on to something else in a moment, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I know a lot of autistic people who out of their friend group are the ones who are asked whether or not someone else really does look good in that outfit right um mm -hmm. because they'll just say no <laughs> and yeah it's just a pure mechanical statement of fact there's no agenda to it really it's not mm -hmm. Haha, <laughs> and I hope that really got them where it where it hurts. It's just mm -hmm. oh, you ask me a question, and I'm just going to not beat around the bush and answer it there and then. There's no agenda. It, it's not. Will this hurt you? Will this not hurt you? It's just. Do That's you right. Know how to no. Well, the, nar <laughs> the narcissist is governed by the pursuit of the prime aims: control, fuel, character traits, and residual benefits, as I've explained many, many occasions previously. And in order to get to those one of or more of those four things. The narcissist is manipulative. Autistic people are not. And the response arises more out of a failure to understand the particular yes. interaction that's right. going on. Whereas with the narcissist, it's not a failure to necessarily understand the interaction, but rather it's governed by a manipulative need to achieve an outcome. So taking your example of does this, do I look good in this dress? And the autistic person quite honestly goes, no, your backside looks huge. And so they just state a fact. Right. And they don't grasp the social interaction, which is a white lie might be useful here. It's quite simply, well, it doesn't look right, it doesn't look right on them. So I'm just saying that. Whereas with the narcissist, the narcissist may also say, 
No, it looks terrible. Your backside looks like the side of a house. But the reason the narcissist has done that is because the narcissism has guided the narcissist to say that, to provoke a reaction in order to control that person and draw fuel from them. Or the narcissist may indeed say that white lie. You look absolutely stunning in it, my darling. And that, of course, is the imposition of cognitive empathy, which is done as a manipulation because it's not genuine. Not only is it incorrect, but it's also not genuine. And so it's done again to ensure that there is a benign manipulation to enable that narcissist to control the victim and draw fuel from them. So again, a further distinction is that in those situations, an autistic individual just simply doesn't comprehend the nature of social interaction. With the narcissist, yeah. it's about getting to something else, i.e. being manipulative to get to the prime aims. Mm. I can remember times when I was a child and if a family member was crying, I might say, why are you crying? You know, mm -hmm. I can remember other family members almost getting irritated because like, mm -hmm. it's obvious, you know, it's like, well, no, it's not. Honestly, tell me, I don't understand why this person is crying. Right. And that takes me to my next point. Um, I wrote a post about two years ago now, uh, arguing that autistic people aren't necessarily self-centered. We're interest centered. Right. So um, and the nature of the autistic mind is that it is interest based and you're probably familiar with the term special interest. Um, mm -hmm. So we zero in on a particular topic, um, particular activity. It could even be a particular person and um, non autistic people would say obsess over it. But to us, it represents this um, center of gravity around which we orbit. And then you'll uh, notice us doing everything we can to steer the conversation back to that topic and maybe tuning out, not listening if people stop talking about whatever the topic is. Um, um, psychology and narcissism and other personality disorders happen to be a special interest of mine, which is why I love having you on, because I... Mm -hmm absolutely love it when people are talking about these kinds of things right it, 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 it makes me stimulated it makes me feel awake but if the topic uh drifts away from if the topic of conversation drifts away from these areas then oh, i find it exceedingly difficult to pay attention to even pretend that i care about what's being said you know we have an aversion to small talk chit chat it doesn't mean anything what's the point in discussing the weather and Aunt Marjorie's hip replacement and, you know, all these random irrelevant topics, right? So mm -hmm. we tend to center around that, right? It's kind of like, yeah, within that prism, things make sense. Oh, I can, yeah, I, I can make sense of the world within the prism of interest. Outside, small talk, doing things unrelated to interests. No, I can't, I don't, you know, it's, 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 it's a confusing mm -hmm. world out there. Um, I, I, I think a comparison and distinction between the two is that if we start from a zero point of the behavior and interaction of an autistic person and a narcissist, at that starting point, as we move forward in time, they can look immensely similar. Mm. Because, for instance, uh, as mentioned, can be direct, can be blunt, doesn't appear to be taking an interest in what somebody else has to do, but rather being self-focused. Yes, there's a distinction, and I agree with you about being interest-centered as opposed to being self-centered, but on first blush, it's a very difficult distinction to make. Is this person actually being interested in the topic, or are they just being interested in talking about it because it's them? But then as the time rolls forward, you'll then see the differences. So it's almost like if you were drawing two lines one for the autistic individual and one for the narcissist as they both start off they look indistinguishable but then the further we go along the narcissist line starts to get wider and wider because it encompasses a greater range of, of behaviors whereas the line for the autistic individual stays fairly one-dimensional if you will mm -hmm. and that's another aspect of it that one-dimensional side to things whereas Although a narcissist is essentially um, a construct and transparent, that construct has many different faces to it, it has many different dimensions. The narcissist plays roles. We're chameleons. So the narcissist will be the corporate raider at work, the family man at home, Mr. Lover Lover Man when he's out with his mates. 
the big, brash, bold, belligerent so-and-so in certain situations and settings, and that he'll be the hyper-religious individual if it's needed, whereas an autistic person stays more or less within that one dimension compared to all of the changes that a narcissist will make. So again, if you observe those two people over a period of time, and this is what essentially comes back down to, is that if you were to deal with an autistic person and a narcissist, and many autistic people can be mistaken for narcissists by the uh, uneducated and those that are only looking at a very small sliver of behavior, they would be indistinguishable. So for instance, if you were to get, a, get some footage of an autistic person and a narcissist and play five seconds of each, you might say, oh, uh, both autistic, both narcissists, which is which? It would be rather difficult to say. You'd have to look at a longer period of time and then you would start to see the divergences in behaviour. Yeah, I made um, a post not so long ago. It was very brief and to the point. I said, it's not that we don't care about you. We do. It's that we're not interested in you a lot of the time. And I think there's yeah. a fundamental difference between the two. I care about you. I love you. But I may just completely drift off and zone out in conversation if the content is unrelated to my interests mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. uh, what was i going to say earlier um so avoiding eye contact and hugs mm -hmm. now autistic people may avoid eye contact for sensory reasons actually we tend to be mm -hmm. very monotropic and tunnel visioned which means outside of our fiber optic attention tunnel the world either doesn't exist or it's completely jarring and if i'm talking to someone um i can either talk to them or look at them in the eye not both that there's too much going on even though that's just two things it's too much and so the aversion of eye contact may be purely sensory in nature it could also do with you know have a lot to do with lack of trust i can remember being a child and not being able to meet the eyes of people i didn't trust but if i felt safe around them it was it would be easier to meet their eyes and i noticed if i'm saying something i'm passionate about i can look at people quite intensely but if there are these kind of borderline uns unsafe situations where i don't understand the conversation they're new people and i'm out of my depth then maybe looking in people's eyes difficult again but essentially to wrap it all up yeah it's difficult uh meeting the gaze of people if yeah at the same time as talking to them it's like either one or the other i can't do i can't multitask in that in that regard and same with hugs i suppose an autistic person may avoid now one autistic person may be very tactile they may love the sensory input of touch being touched and touching other people um but another autistic person may be very averse to it don't touch me please i can't deal with it because they don't like their skin being touched you know it makes them uh really anxious so mm -hmm. any differences or similarities there Let's deal first with the issue of eye contact. Okay. There will be some narcissists that will avoid people's gaze, but for the most part, a narcissist tends to meet the gaze of individuals because we have the narcissistic stare, and it comes in various forms, from that scintillating laser-like vision to draw somebody in in terms of seduction, through to that penetrating black-eyed death stare which is being utilized in order to um, bend that individual to our will so often the narcissist will hold somebody's gaze indeed will do so for longer than many people would actually find comfortable because that's done with the view to controlling them furthermore meeting somebody's gaze for the narcissist is very important with regard to the receipt of fuel as you know, fuel is lifeblood of the narcissist. We receive fuel as various strands. So when we are physically proximate to somebody, we receive the strand of fuel from their body language, the words that they're using, the tone of those words, their facial expression and the look in their eyes. And therefore, if we're not looking at somebody, we're actually depriving ourselves of a strand of fuel which our narcissism would not like us to do. 
So invariably, we are motivated to look at somebody to get that look from them so that we receive the fuel. Now, there will be instances where a narcissist will avoid meeting somebody's gaze, and that's when we're devaluing them. But a lot of the time you will see the narcissist will meet and hold and will probably do so excessively with regard to the gaze. So that's quite a distinction there. Yeah, that, that's, that is quite a distinction, yes. Because yeah. speaking from personal experience, it has nothing to do with the narcissistic explanation that you just um, uh, yeah. put forth there. No, it's nothing to do yeah. with that. So whereas you would find it as a sensory overload, the narcissist actually welcomes that overload of emotion, of luck coming towards them because it's lovely, delicious fuel for us. And also that we want that person to meet our gaze in order to control them as well. So as I say, there are instances where we won't look at somebody, which is perhaps part of the silent treatment, for example, or exhibiting haughty behaviours when they're being devalued, but a lot of the time, the gaze will be met for the reasons that I've outlined. Now, with hugs, mm. again, the the difference the, there is a similarity in that narcissists will often not want to be hugged, mm -hmm. as an autistic person won't want to be. But again, but the difference, the underlying driver is yours is based on a sensory overload. Ours is because it threatens our sense of control. So if we decide that we want to hug somebody else, it's our decision to impose that control upon them. We are essentially comfortable with doing that because we are the one that has chosen to do it. But if somebody hugs us without invitation, then there are two problems. First, it threatens our sense of control because it's their decision to do it to us. And of course, we need that control. And secondly, they've sort of got a jump on us, but taken us by surprise by getting physically proximate to us in that manner so that it threatens the sense of control because it's an imposition of intimacy and okay. we have to reject it we have to reject intimacy because intimacy hints at connection and we connect our victims to us we bolt them onto us but we don't connect in the other way okay. we can't we're not allowed to because if we were connected to you that way we couldn't jettison you in the way that we need to we couldn't put you on the shelf in the way that we need to so with a hug often the narcissist is uncomfortable with it because it can threaten control and it also hints at intimacy. Also, remember that with many, with the narcissist, because we have no emotional empathy and a hug is an expression of empathy, that we can learn how to do it. But often it's quite robotic, cardboard like, stiff backed. And if we get hugged first, our narcissism basically does this damn, incoming hug need to emulate it, what do we need to do again? Oh, it's like this, and there's a delay, and there's a glitch, and it then becomes apparent, and then because there's that, there's this awkwardness, which then threatens the control. Only a really evolved narcissist would be able to respond nice and quickly to think, ah, in comes a hug, no problem, I'll do it naturally. But most narcissists being lesser in mid-range wouldn't be able to respond quick enough. So the narcissism is caught on the hop. I often talk about the imitation game, where if you imagine a huge warehouse with a cherry picker, I mean, there's a certain situation, off goes that cherry picker to find the shelves. And it, it takes a package of uh, responses and emotions and then brings it back and applies it to the narcissist. So old ladies falling down in street, right, we need the package that expresses uh, sympathy and concern. And it comes back and it immediately puts it on the narcissist. So the facial expression changes, the body languages change, body languages change, the words that are spoken alter and the tone alter and sometimes that happens very quickly it's almost seamlessly sometimes there's a delay and people look that's a bit strange it's almost as if they didn't know what to do and then bang in it comes in other instances the cherry picker goes to the shelf and there's nothing there because that type of narcissist hasn't got that package available and when they see mrs miggins lying in the street they just basically stare at them now again you might get an autistic person wouldn't necessarily know how to react in such a situation but then they, they, they would respond more favorably to the way that somebody else sort of says, aren't you going to do anything? Oh, right, okay. Whereas the narcissist would necessarily see that as a threat because a narcissist that has cognitive empathy would already have been able to do something to help Mrs. Miggins. A lesser narcissist wouldn't have that uh, facade operating. And so when they're told, aren't you going to do something, they're more likely to react with, like what? 
she fell over, it's her own fault. Which again, <laughs> we'll, have the, we'll have the distinction because the lesser narcissist doesn't have that cognitive empathy there. So rather than go, oh, yes, sorry, I, I didn't know what to do at first, but now you've prompted me. I now know that I need to be kind to her because a mid-range narcissist would do it to begin with because they have that cognitive empathy. They go, oh, dear, poor Mrs. Miggins. And, and there would be the pretense of concern. The lesser narcissist would go, would stop. And then if somebody prompted, aren't you going to help her? And that suggestion of you should help her is a threat to control. So the narcissist who's a lesser is more likely going to turn around and go, what for? She's not my mother. <laughs> and be dismissive. On the topic of empathy, I often find myself feeling sorry for poor Mrs. Miggins. She's often in unfortunate circumstances in your fantasies, HG. Um, well, that, that's her problem. She needs to deal with it. <laughs> oh, no. Right, let's have a look. Accountability. Everything is my fault versus nothing is my fault. Mm -hmm. um, now, as autistic people we are more susceptible to trauma and invalidation. We receive a lot of negative feedback from the moment we exit the womb on a sensory level, on the level of people not understanding us, on the level of people, you know, hurling insults at us. And we kind of internalise uh, this um, idea that we must be inherently faulty. Um, yeah. And a lot of us have a reputation for apologising for everything. Um, okay. I often, I often go into situations just believing that by the time the situation or the day or the event concludes, I will do something that will invariably upset people. And I somehow convince myself, I have got a lot better at this, by the way. So I'm thinking of like a few years ago. I will okay. somehow convince myself that, yep, that was your doing. It must have been my doing because that is what life has shown me. It's shown me that I do, because, you know, we can be clumsy, we can be blunt, we can um, not have particularly uh, intact common sense, we can be naive. Um, it's a minefield, the world, as an okay. autist, without sounding too much like a victim it can be a minefield because there's so much you can get wrong all the time there are all of these arbitrary and dare I say bullshit social rules and conventions everywhere that we could be totally blind to and so it's so easy to fuck up and yeah it makes us think right cool maybe I'll just say and I know lots of people who apologize so profusely that it's it's like an identity. I am wrong, you know. Um, so you. So would it be fair to say that you would uh, you take accountability, perhaps to an excessive level, to the point where it could. I think in the past I could have actually been taken advantage of with that thing, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Because maybe people think, oh well, he will admit to it, even yeah, you know, so whether he's whether he's in the wrong or not, he will admit to it. So I've been in those situations because I think it, I must have been wrong. It's me, you know. Mm. So there's an acceptance of accountability, but almost uh, uh, to a sense going too far in the direction of almost uh, accepting accountability over and over again and being apologetic for it. Whereas, of course, as you know, the narcissist rejects accountability because accountability threatens control. So you will either get a narcissist that will go, nothing to do with me, I'm not at fault, blunt rejection, or, well, yes, I had an affair, but only because you made me, because you don't have sex with me any longer, the blame shifting. So there's a, there's a sort of admission, but there isn't, because it's actually not a genuine admission, because immediately that mid-range narcissist says, I've engaged in the behaviour of which you accuse me, but actually I am not at fault because you put me in that position. So you have a clear distinction here between the autistic individual that, a, that uh, not only recognises accountability but goes in, in, in overloads on saying, sorry, sorry, I, 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 I've done something wrong, I, I'm sorry about that. Whereas with the narcissist, the narcissist will either just point blank not to apologise at all, what have I got to be sorry for, I've not done anything wrong, or will apologise but it's false contrition, and you'll know it's false contrition because there'll be a but. 
So I know it upsets you when I don't talk to you, but if you didn't nag me, I wouldn't have to. I wouldn't have to have a time out. Mm. I know it hurt that I slapped you just then, but you were getting in my face, so I had to calm you down. So there's often the use of a but. So the apology that's offered isn't a true apology, and there's the blame shifting that's involved with it. Mm -hmm. I and I'm. I guess I'm aware of the fact that autistic people come in many different shapes and sizes as well and there could be um on the part of some autistic people a failure to recognize their actions you know um it could be it could be uh saying something that could be quite insulting they're like oh what did i say something you know yeah you just said this oh right okay it's a hurtful thing oh is it mm. well, like, you know you can get these justifications from the autistic side as well but there are prob there's probably still a distinction. But there. I think you could, there is a distinction because it's almost, if I may say so, a sort of almost innocent childlike yeah, innocent, response it, to it. it. Is. it it's, so I, I, oh, I, did, I didn't realise. So often autistic people are entirely clueless about the damage that they can cause around them because it's not born out of the need for control or any malicious response. And say, what, I, I've upset them, have I? Yes, you have. Oh, oh how? And it's explained, and it's more like a oh right, I didn't realise. Thank you for pointing yeah, it out it's to me. Rather, rather, rather than turning around and, and just rejecting it wholesale. So again, mm -hmm. the starting point is very similar. So a lesson asked says, "Why? What? What's? What? What are you crying for?" And an autistic person, "What are you crying for?" And then, so at, the, at that moment, there's no distinction. Then thereafter, well, I, I'm I'm crying because. Oh, right, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't realise. The lesson asked us go, what's that got to do with me? Or mm -hmm. why, you're crying because your dog's dead. Well, he was going to die next year anyway, so I don't see what you're getting so upset about. Utterly dismissive. Whereas because an autistic person does, has em does have empathy, it sometimes needs to almost to be prodded into action. Right, okay. That is the other, so there's definitely a distinction. And what do you think about this one? Autistic adherence to routine. Um, there have been times when I have insisted on finishing what I'm doing, even though someone else might need me. I feel bad and guilty, but I still can't bring myself to stop until I'm satisfied that what I mm -hmm. have started has logically concluded. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it's difficult, right? Because I have to think, I, I do think to myself, oh man, oh God, no, why now? Why do they need me now? You know, and I know they need me and I feel guilty. And I might yeah. think, just got to quickly rush and do this, you know, quickly do this, quickly do this, you know. Um, but I, it's like I have to finish it because if I can't yeah. not finish it, um, mm -hmm. it's it's. Can you see what I'm saying here? I do. I mean, the, the the broad distinction again there is that autistic people like structure and predictability, yeah. whereas with a narcissist, you will have instances of structure and predictability, but it's actually not that. It is more a dogmatic adherence to the need for control and the rejection of an, an interfering influence. And again, at first blush, both will look immensely similar. So you're told you need to go and do this, but you're, I don't know, building something out of Lego and you want to finish your <laughs> the, the, the TIE fighter that you're making out of Lego. And a narcissist wants to finish making a TIE fighter out of Lego. Yours is because you have that structure and predictability of the thing that you're interested in. And when somebody else is pulling you away from it, that it makes you feel uncomfortable. With the narcissist, it's not about the discomfort of the, the, the interest in the task, but rather you are telling me to stop doing something. That translates to a threat to control. You're trying to control me. And therefore, there is a reaction. And the both reaction could be quite similar. Leave me alone. I'm busy. But then what you again would have to look at is this range of behaviours that thereafter, you would notice that with the autistic individual, this repeatedly happens where they're engrossed in the task, they have to get it done before they can move on to the next thing. Whereas you will notice that with a narcissist, sometimes they will break off from what they're doing because their narcissism dictates that in those circumstances, oh, yeah. that's, an that's, an, that's an appropriate thing for them to go and do. So can, the narcissist might feel, say, surely. yeah, so the narcissist might say, well, Actually, I'm going, to, I'm going to stop making this TIE fighter because that actually isn't giving me any fuel. And I can turn around and go, oh, what's that, darling? You need some help taking out the rubbish and goes and helps because that enables that benign 
assertion right. of control and the receipt of fuel. So you will see that you will get, going back to the point about different modes and personalities, the autistic person is, if you will, reliable in their adherence to that structure and predictability. Whereas with the narcissist, they will flip from sometimes remaining engrossed in the task to reject the outside interference. Then on other occasions, they will break off because it suits them to do so. And you, in a way, get both chaos and control uh, within the world of the narcissist. So it's a, a, a distinction that comes out again over time. So there'll be some times where you can see a clear distinction between an autistic person and a narcissistic person, or a narcissist rather. And in other instances, at first blush, they will look one and the same, and you've got to wait a bit, or you've got to look over the behavior over a period of time to then see the distinctions. Sure. Okay. There is a term we use in the autistic world called inertia, which is a difficulty with shifting gears or transitioning. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we could be, we could find ourselves plugged in to activity one, and it takes a considerable amount of energy uh, to withdraw from that and engage with something else. So you often find maybe autistic kids have difficulty getting off of their Xbox and sitting at the dinner table because Xbox is what they're doing right now. That feels safe. That feels nice. Why you're going to have to advance a pretty compelling reason for why I do anything else but that, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of my colleagues is married to an autistic man and she was in need of medical attention and she called him. He was in the shed uh, on the uh, stationary bike and he said to her, 10 more minutes, you know, mm -hmm because he hadn't finished what he was doing. It needed to reach yeah. a, log a, yeah. a logical completion before he could withdraw from that. And then, oh, right, now my wife needs me, you know. Yeah. And you see, again, if somebody was observing that without any other information about who they were witnessing, they could think, my goodness me, uh, her call for help is a threat to his control. He's rejecting that threat to control by saying 10 minutes. He's showing a complete absence of emotional empathy for her. So in that snapshot, it would again be very difficult to, to discern between the two. Let the film play a bit longer, and then you see all, uh, a divergence of reactions. So there are going to be instances where it is quite difficult to tell the two apart. Sure. But over time, you always will be able to. Oh, of course, absolutely. Now, um, one thing autistic people are known for is our, our strong drive for justice this extreme intolerance to when things aren't fair. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I wondered whether that even exists within the narcissistic dynamic. <clears throat> Justice is an empathic trait. So we don't have it, you do. Your pursuit of justice is as a consequence of finding certain things unfair. Now, a narcissist will hijack the concept of justice as a means to the assertion of control. Think about those individuals that decide that um, they're going to campaign about something, both on the left and on the right, and invariably the relevant core celebre is hijacked by a narcissist mm. under the auspices of this is appropriate, this is justice. And... Again, you will see that certain narcissists appear to have a fixation with justice. But again, looking at the range of behaviours that occur, you will see that it is self-serving. Whereas with an autistic person, it won't be self-serving. In fact, you probably almost have a fastidious and slavish devotion to the uh, alleviating the unfairness. Whereas you will notice with a narcissist, they will be far more fluid about the application of it. So there'll be a, a huge advocate of justice so long as it suits their aims. And then all of a sudden, they're not interested anymore. Why? Because their narcissism dictates it's not to their interest to engage in that particular campaign. So leave it behind. It's the bandwagoning that you'll often see with a narcissist. And there's a particular narcissist that I speak about quite often in my video series, because she's an excellent example, that she is wholly guilty of appearing to pursue justice on behalf of the downtrodden, on behalf of young girls to empower them to, for the purposes of um, empowering women 
to stand up for people who are from racial minorities, to stand up for working mothers, and to stand up for lesbian hunchback dwarfs with one leg, or whatever particular bandwagon comes her way. Virtue signaling. But, virtue signaling, but you'll notice that whereas your concept of justice may well be that you get your shoulder behind the campaign, and that you spend your time emailing and advocating and drumming up support and you talk about it regularly and you do so over a period of time until you get a result in some shape or form, you'll notice, particularly with mid range lesser narcissists aren't that bothered. Ah, they're not particularly interested. Mid-range narcissists, they love it. It's a cause. But as you've heard me explain, if they can achieve it by talking about it rather than doing anything about it, you'll notice all they'll do is talk about it. And then they're <laughs> on, the, on to the next cause. Whereas with an autistic person, you'll almost have that obsessional, that, that obsessive pursuit of it. And it manifests both in talking about it and doing it. Whereas most of the time you'll find with a narcissist, they leave the doing to other people. They only stick with it for a short period of time before they butterfly onto the next type of thing. And so, again, there is a distinction that could be observed, and, and that's applicable to the concept of justice. OK, thank you. Right, let's have a look. Um, oh, the difference between an autistic meltdown or sensory mm -hmm. overload and um, rage and ignited fury, is that what you call it? That's right, yeah. So, yeah, so the autistic perspective first. Um and I think you sometimes explain how empaths might experience an environmental stressor which erodes their emotional empathy. And Correct. when I'm giving presentations, I, and this is what uh, um, astounded me when I first heard you describe this in a video, I, I described something quite similar, and I call it an inner protector and mm -hmm. how um, the emotional empathy might temporarily lift off of us when we're experiencing overload. And you might get an autistic uh, person who fires a load of insults at a person, or in some cases, um, trashes the house um, and maybe uh, physically attacks a loved one, because at that point, they're not a loved one. They are yeah. this... Um, quivering mass of horror standing in their way depriving them of that sense of safety and mm -hmm. then what happens is they will continue to explode until you know they burn themselves out and then once they've calmed down the emotional empathy returns and it's like oh my god what yeah. the hell there's you know could I have really done this have I you know mm -hmm. So we see lots of that kind kind of thing in the autistic mm -hmm. world. So, mm -hmm. and and this could what? Why would this happen? You know, I I notice I get a lot more irritable when I'm surrounded by um, abrasive sounds or when there is a sound occurring outside of a conversation. You know, it gets my heart rate up. It makes me angry. It makes me angry at the source mm -hmm. of the noise. So it could be coming from a person. It's like, can you turn that off? Fuck's sake, you know. Um, mm -hmm. but that is contingent upon the sensory discomfort um, mm -hmm. now yeah and then you as I said before uh, use this term called ignited fury so I suppose that to me you know autistic lashings out would come from complete overload you know you don't it hijacks your prefrontal cortex less control over your behaviors uh, emotion is flooding your very vessel um mm -hmm. impinging upon your capacity to cope and think rationally etc but then we calm down the balance is restored and there's this overwhelming sense of regret and remorse surging through your body oh my god and then this self-hatred as well like only an evil, despicable uh, being would carry out such a heinous attack, right? Mm -hmm. So we're likely to see this kind of dynamic. So now the narcissist's experience, please. Well, your trigger is, a, is this sort of sensory overload and a, a lack of familiarity. Ours goes to the issue of control. So 
for instance, you're on your own in a particular situation, as you mentioned, these abrasive sounds are coming in and that causes irritability with you. The narcissist is sat on his own and he hears this noise, these, these abrasive noises. That's not going to that's not going to trigger a threat to control. So you wouldn't see a sort of meltdown from the narcissist in those, in those circumstances. But if the narcissist was trying to talk to somebody and that noise was affecting their ability to assert control over the other person by talking to them, then whatever was creating that alternative noise is threatening the narcissist's sense of control, which could, co could cause them, dependent upon facade management, et cetera, the type of narcissist they are, to lose their temper by the ignited fury, to lash out at the workman perhaps who's next door uh, using an angle grinder or is uh, sandpapering something rather rather uh, uh, enthusiastically that makes all of that noise. So uh, an instance would be, let's take a narcissist on their own hammering a nail into a wall. They're on their own. And if it's, they're struggling to do it, they might mutter under their breath, but they're not going to show an ignited fury. But if they're doing it and they hit their, hit their uh, thumb with the hammer, they're on their own. They, they may probably curse and go, ouch. But if there's someone stood next to them, the fact that they're failing to put this nail into the wall makes them look stupid in front of that person and therefore threatens their control over that person. So that narcissist may well turn and say to them, look what you made me do. Now, that person didn't do anything. But the point is, is that when you are on your own and the narcissist on their own, you could still have a meltdown in effect, but the narcissist won't. Because the meltdown for the narcissist is affected basically as a consequence of control with other people with regard to the ignited fury. Now, there is an alternative aspect where a narcissist suffers a fuel crisis. Now, that's something different, because, of course, you mentioned ignited fury. So... If you have a sort of an angry response, you can do so on your own as a consequence of the uh, lack of familiarity and sensory overload. The narcissist will not ignite fury on their own because there's no threat to control. There has to be some threat to control, which invariably comes from another person doing something or failing to do something. Okay. Where a narcissist can have a meltdown on their own is where they're in a fuel crisis, but that's something different. That's fascinating. Um... There's some questions and some of them I want to ask now because I really want to know the answer as well. Um, mm -hmm. Someone is talking about narcissists and the use of gods and lions and wolves in WhatsApp uh, pictures and Instagram pictures and, you know, social media pictures, etc. What's the obsession right. with lions and and the like? Not something I'm entirely familiar with, uh, though um, I, I can't recall seeing particularly many lion profiles and WhatsApp people that I deal with. However, what will be happening there is if that person is identified as a narcissist, it's character trait acquisition. The lion is proud, noble, king of the jungle, and therefore the narcissist acquires those traits and utilizes that as the avatar. But again, I make the point, just because somebody might have a lion avatar, that doesn't mean that they're a narcissist. If you know that person is a narcissist, their, their use of the lion as an avatar or a wolf or whatever is character trait acquisition. Okay, thank you. An explanation of word salads and why they are used? Because um, just before you answer, actually, um, autistic people may ha experience differences in our use of language. Some people are completely non-speaking. Um, some of us may experience aphasia, which is when words come out um, in a kind of jumbled, incoherent yes. way. Um, there's a autistic musician called Daniel Wakeford, and he has a very interesting style of speaking. I encourage anyone watching to listen to some of his interviews. And um, to the, you know, a lot of people would listen to, to some of us and think, oh gosh, you know, you're not using those words in the right context. Or, you know, sometimes my verbal comprehension is quite high, but 
sometimes I notice that when I'm low on mental energy, I may fail to find a word or I might use a word incorrectly. And mm-hmm. I'm not trying to bamboozle. It's just coming. It's just emerging from, you know, mental fatigue. So, yeah, word salads and why they're used. OK, well, as you've touched upon, uh, word salads aren't just the preserve of narcissists and they can appear with other mental health conditions. So the non-narcissist word salad you've touched on is where it really is almost sort of gobbledygook. And you get somebody who might start saying, so I went to the shop and the green wolf was there eating the ice cream before the moon came crashing down. And you understand each word that's being said, but the sentence makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. It's neurological. It's neurological origins, yeah. Yeah. Whereas with the narcissist, the use of a word salad is there to nullify a threat to control. Mm -hmm. So somebody's challenged the narcissist by asking them why they've done a certain thing, and the narcissist will launch into a long, involved explanation, which doesn't make any sense in terms of what they are talking about. But if you were to look at it as a paragraph, you would go, yeah, okay, yeah, that all reads there, but I need some kind of context to understand it. But they're being accused of something and they will start saying, well, the reason I'm late, as you know, is a consequence that I've actually had a very, very important meeting this evening. And of course, the person they're talking to thinks, no, you haven't, you've been in the pub. And then they start talking about all of these things that they've been doing. And it's just this blur of words that comes out, which they understand what they are saying, but they don't make any sense in relation to what's being spoken about. And it goes on and on and on. And it's often condescending in nature. It can be quite... uh, it can be a, a mess of an idea that they're trying to advance. Where you're thinking, I'm trying to, I'm trying to follow this, but I'm struggling actually to understand where it's all actually going and what its relevance is to this situation. And of course, if you then go, that, that doesn't make any sense. The narcissist will come back at you and go, well, I wouldn't expect someone as stupid as you to understand right. what I'm talking about. And you get that sort of haughty response to it. I usually see word salads being used by people who are kind of like self-help gurus yeah now, they're yeah, throwing absolutely. that kind of these mystical spiritual jargony words together and a lot of their readers and listeners will be awestruck thinking like oh wow that's profound when yeah you really pass those individual words you're like that doesn't make any sense like and, exactly. and autistic it's... people will spot it instantly because we yeah. look for logic and sense and sequence so that happens and i'm like wait wait what what, what? excuse me that's like, right. That's right. So it, it's, it's for instance, uh, I recall having a conversation with somebody and this individual, whenever I would make a remark, she would say, I, I, I will honour that. And I thought to myself, you haven't issued a promise to me that you need to honour. Your, your statement is pretentious and doesn't actually make sense in the context of what I've just said. And although it was only a short sentence, that was word salad. Because what are you actually saying? I, I, I will honour that. I haven't asked you to honour anything. Right. Okay. Rather than just, ra- so rather than say, yes, that's right, or I agree, I will honour that. It was this pretentious gobbledygook. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. Let's have a look. Um, where are we right now? Um, we've done that, we've done. So lots of autistic people do mask, as uh, I explained earlier, because we feel many of us feel very invalidated from a young age. We might engage in a stim in public. So we flap our hand or we Uh repeat um, a word again and again and again. The teachers tell us off, the other children uh, make fun of us. And so we think, oh, right, I can't do that. I can't do that. And we observe how other children are behaving and think, okay, how is it that I can be normal and fit in without revealing any of my autistic quirks and eccentricities? Um, And a lot of that sounds like the kind of facade management that you often speak about, Um, but presumably presumably there must be a difference somewhere Um, Mm. because we might do it to fit in, to not draw attention to ourselves. Well, it is a form of facade management, but again, what is the purpose of it? You're not doing it to control anybody else. You're not doing it to draw fuel. 
And also, often what is apparent from the things that you're saying, Harry, is that you're capable of self-reflection about your behaviours. Mm. That you analyse the way that you've done and think, what can I do? What have I done? Have I done something wrong? Or I'll say sorry, because I've, I've, I've evidently done something wrong. I apologise. Oh, right, I'm giving myself away with the hand flapping here. Right, I need to adjust my behaviour so I don't do all of that. The narcissist doesn't self-reflect because we're always right. Everybody else is wrong. Facade management is an instinctive response that comes from a mid-range narcissist, whereby the narcissism guides them to do it. So the, nar- the mid-range narcissist doesn't go, right, <clears throat> I'd better keep my ignited fury in check in this meeting, otherwise I'm going to look like a total douche canoe and I won't get that promotion. They don't. It just happens because the narcissism recognises in order to maintain control over everybody here, the last thing that we want to do is suddenly turn around and bite the nose of the managing director, even though we might be tempted to do it. So the narcissism guides that mid-range narcissist to manage their facade. The greater narcissist manages facade also and does so in an aware way, but it is different because whilst it's not instinctive, the greater narcissist has a much greater threshold of control over that ignited fury and therefore has an array of options that can be utilised. You, so again, the greater narcissist doesn't self-reflect on the behaviours because that doesn't serve any purpose. It slows us down. It isn't necessary. Yes, I might think about the way that something was done before in order to improve upon it, but I don't sit there with a scotch in my hand late at night thinking, oh, you are an awful man, Mr Tudor. How do you live with yourself? Because... I just don't, and that wouldn't serve any purpose for me to do so. And no narcissist does that. They might claim to do that for the purpose of assertion of control over somebody. Oh, I sit at home and I lament the fact that I'm a terrible human being, says the middle mid-range B narcissist, trying to evoke sympathy from the person that he's controlling. So your responses are based upon genuine self-reflection, and it isn't being done to mislead, to control, to draw fuel. So again, you have a similarity, and, and all people manage, manage their appearance to some extent. When you meet somebody for the first time, you don't immediately go, how oh, the fuck are you, and grip their balls and give them a shake. You shake hands with them. Now, as time goes on and you get to know somebody better, you might josh with them a bit more when you meet them. And so everybody manages their appearance, but facade management in the truest sense is the creation of something which isn't genuine. Whereas managing your appearance is more on a sort of spectrum of behaviour rather than creating something that's false. So you're managing your appearance when you're looking to stop the hand flapping or conceal it, whereas a narcissist is creating something entirely false in order to mislead that person into giving them the prime aims. That's a remarkable distinction. Thank you. Um, Right. So narcissism, autism. Autism, autism, the origins of both. Um, now, there is no evidence whatsoever to suggest autism uh, is the result of trauma, certainly not okay. the result of vaccines. Um, we know that autist- we know that it runs in families. Being autistic, uh, you know, means that one or both of your parents are autistic and so on. Uh, down the line. Um, How do narcissists come into being, HG? Narcissists are created as a consequence of a genetic predisposition. So there is an inheritance of the capacity to become a narcissist that's come from mother, father, perhaps further back in the lineage. And then that must be allied with a lack of control environment. So you're basically having nature and nurture coming together to create the narcissist so if you don't have the genetic predisposition but you're subjected to a traumatic environment no narcissist if you have the genetic predisposition but no lack of control no narcissist you have the two a narcissist may well be created but sometimes you see the lack of control environment might be stymied by an intervener so let's take for example a young boy his father's a narcissist his mother is not Mm-hmm. He, has the genetic, he has the genetic predisposition from his father. He grows up in a turbulent household where he witnesses his father beating his mother. He can't defend his mother, so he has no control over that situation. His father is emotionally absent with him. 
that he has no control over that situation. However, he spends a lot of time at school and he spends a lot of time uh, with his grandma who shields him from some of the behaviors and in a sense doesn't allow him to be exposed to the lack of control environment to the extent that it cements the creation of narcissism. So you will find some individuals who will say, well, I know for a fact that my father was a narcissist and I witnessed some horrible things. Why did I not become a narcissist? Either the genetic predisposition skipped you or there was an intervener of some description. It might be school, it might be a relative. Similarly, you could have somebody who doesn't have narcissists for parents and becomes a narcissist. Why? It came from granddad. So it skipped dad, came down to son, and those, he actually has two empathic parents, but the son witnesses his parents being killed in a road accident before his very eyes. And that instant moment of trauma over which he has no control whatsoever is a immense lack of control environment. He's got the genetic, the genetic predisposition bang, a narcissist is created. So essentially, it's genetic predisposition add lack of control environment, but there's some quite interesting variations that go with it in terms of whether that will actually happen or not. And I think this could be perhaps the most important difference so far, because where it seems that uh, narcissism is the result of nature and nurture, it seems the existence of an autistic person is largely uh, nature. Um, yes. So that is an interesting one. And there was another question I was going to ask. What was it? What the hell was it? Oh, yes. Can you be a, a narcissist and an autistic person? Um, I think so. I believe so. Um, if there is a genetic component, especially, uh, and perhaps an autistic person is likely to uh, come upon a, uh, what do you call it, um, a lack of control in environment. Um, but yeah, I mean, that I, I, yeah, that would be my position. I believe so. Yes, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. No, that they're, they're not. Um, because you, you could have basically somebody who is a narcissist who doesn't understand social interactions, um, lacks intuition, um, engages in and is triggered by a lack of familiarity and sensory overload so you could have an autistic narcissist wow okay right are you good to stay until half past again hg or yes you... okay perfect right so um i have come to the end of my points but we certainly have some questions here and if you, if you haven't already um everyone who's watching please get your questions in now we have about 25 more minutes i'm just going to scroll back to see if i have any uh let's have a look um okay so okay um how do narcissists react to being wound up by someone like if someone's like trolling them poking fun at them if they're the butt of a joke. Many narcissists don't have senses of humour. I do. I have an excellent sense of humour. You're, many you're hilarious. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Trolling uh, or winding a narcissist up is challenge fuel. So very simply, whenever you have an interaction with a narcissist, it falls into one of three outcomes and only ever will. You are either giving us pure fuel so if you say, I love you, HG, you're giving me pure positive fuel. If you're crying because I've just uh, done something nasty to you, you're giving me pure negative fuel. So in those instances, you're giving me fuel and you're giving me control. Everything is wonderful in the world of narcdom. If you ignore me or you forget my birthday or you don't answer the telephone, you're not giving me any fuel and you're threatening my control. And that's the worst thing that you can do to me. And then we have the middle position. You're giving me fuel because you're interacting with me, reacting to me, responding to me, but you're doing something which threatens my control. So if you were to say, HG, you're an asshole, the fact you're insulting me gives me fuel, that's fine. But because you're in insulting me and I have an excellent conceit of myself, I take exception to that. Now, 
dependent upon the type of narcissist that you're dealing with. So if you're winding up a lesser narcissist, you're likely to get punched in the face because they have a rudimentary uh, range of responses to that threat to control. They don't operate with a facade. They don't have cognitive empathy. They have a low threshold on their ignited fury. So winding up a lesser narcissist may well see you getting headbutted or a punch in the chops. When you're dealing with a mid-range narcissist, they have a facade. So if there's a group of people sat around a table in the pub and one is needling the narcissist and there's other people there, the narcissist has to control everybody that's around that table. So if all of a sudden he launched across and bit the nose of the person giving him trouble, the other people would react badly to that. The narcissist hasn't done its job properly because it's not got control over everybody, sought control over one, but lost it with regard to the other four. So more usually, that type of narcissist, trying to maintain a facade, will probably sit there and start to sulk, or go, why, why are you being so horrible to me? I've not said anything to you. Why, why do you have to pick on me? You're always picking on me to try and elicit sympathy from other people around the table who'll step in and get, come on, John, leave him alone. You've gone a bit far here. And so that allows the assertion of control and the maintenance of control over people. Now, with a greater narcissist or the ultra such as I, if someone was needling, then it's a simple case of using some charm, wit and vast intelligence to basically put that person down in a way which has everybody laughing at them instead and you turn the tables on them. So to recap, needling, trolling, winding up a narcissist challenge fuel. It threatens our sense of control. We must do something about it. Dependent on the type of narcissist that you're doing it to, the reaction to assert that control and nullify the threat will vary. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's have a look here. What effect does alcohol have on the emotional sensitivity slash empathy levels? Of a narcissist or just generally? Maybe... Uh... Carly, could you um, specify that one and I'll, I'll get back to you. OK, so just before Carly specifies this. Um, I, so. And this probably goes back to the. Um, the or the or the autistic uh, versus narcissist um, conversation, but I've come across narcissists or at least very narcissistic people who claim to be good at absolutely everything, claim to be experts in every field, even if yeah. even if they've never done it before, right? Now, yeah. now you might ask an autistic person about an area of interest. Um, oh, are you any good at that? And they'll say, yes, I'm brilliant. But mm -hmm. then you'll ask them if they're good at something else. And they'll say, no, I'm absolutely crap. You know, and as a, again, it's not coming from grandiosity. It's just coming from pure honesty. But... Mm -hmm. I've dealt with narcissists who, and I'm like, but they don't know anything about football or ballet or cooking or any of this. It's like, what what is going on inside their brain to convince them that they have any experience, much less this kind of glowing background of excellence in that particular field? Well... <clears throat> With certain narcissists, they have an inherent ability and their narcissism takes hold of that inherent ability and maximizes it. So somebody who's a fantastic footballer and they're a narcissist, they boast and brag about it, but there's substance behind it. They are an exceptional footballer. But many narcissists, of course, don't have it. So it's, you know, all the gear, no idea. But remember, when there is the suggestion to say to the narcissist, you any good at golf? That is a challenge, and the narcissist must deal with it. Now, some narcissists um, will play the "oh no, not me, not particularly good at all," and be humble about it. When, uh, in order to nullify that threat to control, because the narcissist basically says, "Don't go there." Mm. But typically, with lesser narcissists, they think they can do anything and everything, and they'll go, "Oh yeah." Me, I play off five, and it's bullshit. But in that moment, the narcissism tells the narcissist that they play off five, so they say that, and they truly believe it, because that lie is their truth. And it's done to 
impose that on the person that they're talking to. So they go, wow, that's impressive. When they respond like that, they demonstrate right. that they're under control and they're providing fuel. Yeah. So many narcissists don't have a competence, don't have that ability and so forth. And what happens is their narcissism causes them to believe that they are far superior to what they are. Because remember, talking about it is easy. And in that moment, you're being asked, hey, are you any good at playing this video game? Absolutely, I'm the dog's bollocks at that. You should see my high score and so on and so forth. You, the narcissist can talk a good game any yeah, day yeah. of the week. And that's, what enables, and that's what enables the assertion of control and drawing of fuel, you see. Yes. Uh, pardon my interruptions. I get excited. Um, I was going to say, it could be an... Ag I think it becomes more complicated when it's based on an element of truth. So they might have done a first aid course, but then they'll go to a party and claim to have a medical degree. Um, but it could it, it could be it could be based on something, but it's just oh, absolutely. You would get some narcissists where there's no there's nothing to it at all, and, and it would be a bold and barefaced lie. But the recipient might not know that, so they can get away with it because it's not. So, for instance, if you've got a, if, if you've got any medical skills, yeah, absolutely, yeah, I can do this, this, and this. Wow! But they're not being called on to exhibit it there and then, so it doesn't really matter. So they can say yes, I have, when they haven't. Um, in other instances, you're right, there's something there, but the narcissism exaggerates it because it's more impressive because narcissists don't do the mundane. Mm. Many, narciss many narcissists are mundane. They're, they are beige, but that's no good. Being beige doesn't get reactions. We have to be scarlet and electric yellow and all so forth. So the narcissists would go, yeah, absolutely. I've just actually finished at a shift at the hospital where I've just performed life heart <laughs> life-saving surgery what <laughs> says somebody else i didn't realize you do that. did you not know that oh yeah 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 and, it, and often some people just think that is absolute errant nonsense but in the narcissist world he believes it because his narcissism tells him it's true so some narcissists are better at fitting in that they uh, by way of character trait acquisition and and exaggeration they say something which has got a kernel of truth about it and they often can do it in quite convincing ways so you what option you often find is that you will have a quick witted narcissist who is of a degree of intelligence that is suitably quick on their feet that they are able to deal with each challenge and threat by bluffing it so i can't remember the name of the film but it was one of the mcgann brothers was in it who basically was in a hospital and he found himself playing the role of a doctor and he basically used a bit of common sense and a bit of basically um, bluff and he put the white coat on and had the stethoscope and because it was so busy. And he was able to respond in a way which sounded sensible. And then he had it about him to pick up by way of character trait acquisition, how to actually do the job that he then actually started doing various medical procedures for people, even though he had no qualifications <laughs> whatsoever. So he, he, he acquired the character traits and through a combination of bullshit and bluff, passed off the fact that he was a doctor. So that character was clearly a narcissist. So some are better at doing it than others. You know, there will be individuals where you hear them speak and you go, that's absolute tripe. He's talking nonsense. Um, and you get those people go, I, I did play for Manchester United. And <laughs> I did. I had I, I trials. No, you didn't. You, you couldn't even <laughs> kick a ball straight when I was with you at school. Yeah, you, you're just saying that to be, you're saying that to be mean. You're saying that to be mean. And everybody knows that they're a bullshitter and it's almost laughable because their the <laughs> lies are so out, the lies are so out there. That people just go, oh, here he comes again, Billy bullshit. Yeah, yeah. What's what 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 um, story he's going to tell us this week? And they believe it because their narcissism tells them. Other narcissists, it's more sophisticated. There is a kernel of truth, and they have the speed of reaction and, and intelligence to create something which has a degree of plausibility. And it's only when they come up against somebody who is the real deal and starts to ask them some perhaps technical questions that they then come unstuck and they have to deflect or retreat from the conversation. So often you might get somebody who's there at a drinks party and go, yes, yeah, just flown in, flown into ship, particularly busy airport. And, uh, they know a little bit about flying aircraft, so they talk. And then uh, lo and behold, somebody at the same party says, oh, hello, I'm a pilot too. I'm a KLM, who are you with? <laughs> and immediately the narcissist might try and bluff it out until that person then starts to ask a few difficult questions. Now, remember, of course, the narcissist often gets away with it because quite simply, most people are too nice and that they would think, oh, right, well, I'm, 
because you don't immediately start cross-examining somebody when you first meet them. When they say, oh, you know, I'm an airline pilot with uh, EasyJet, you don't go, but are you really? Explain to me how you are a pilot. Yeah, right, right, don't. okay. Because why would most... You'd why would most people make that up? Like it's, it's exactly true. you don't you you don't assume the person that's talking to you is lying. The, the world operates on a huge amount of trust, and so if, if you don't have any information to the contrary, you're not immediately going to say to them, "I don't think you're an EasyJet pilot." Why would you do that? Most people don't like conflict. You've no evidence to suggest that that person is not. So therefore, you accept at face value, and that's why it's often very easy for our kind to get away with so much because people do accept so much at face value based upon their in uh, their innate trust i guess um all the different periods of the relationship the terms have slipped my mind the beginning bit when they're mm -hmm. trying to woo the, sedu the, sedu the seduction i th this is what i am confused by how do they think they're going to be able to keep up these lies like they could walk in affluent neighborhoods and say oh yeah that's that's my house that's my gaff i live there you know with a swimming pool and everything and, and i think how are they going to keep that lie up like do they, do they oh, not because you themselves? because you because you think about how it might be might be maintained L lesser and mid-range narcissists don't don't think about yesterday or tomorrow they think about now <laughs> so it, so in the moment yes yes i have a uh i have a huge house in Hampstead. It's got uh, a gym in the basement. It's got a swimming pool, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you, you must come round and see it sometime. Oh, absolutely. Um, could I have your number? Certainly, there you are. Now, that narcissist doesn't go, oh, shit, I've given my number, which means they may well want to come round and all of a sudden I actually <laughs> live in a, in, a, in, a, in a, I live in a dustbin. How am I going to get out of this? He doesn't, because in that moment, his narcissism is telling him that he lives in that huge house. So he says that in order to assert control. He is not concerned about being caught in the lie because his narcissism isn't thinking about what's coming next. It's just thinking about it in that moment. <laughs> and then that person rings up and says, and, and he, he, uh, he, he lives, uh, let's say he just lives in this two bedroom apartment somewhere. And a few weeks later, that person rings and says, I'm oh, making contact with you again. Now, Certain narcissists would remember what they've told and would then deflect by saying, love for you to come over, but just having some interior works done, new statues being put in place is a little bit hazardous, but I'll tell you what, I'll come and meet you at Lorenzo's wine bar and we'll, we'll, we'll have a sup down there. No problem, see you later. That's a more evolved narcissist that might come out with that kind of comment. But another type of narcissist hasn't remembered what's been said in the past because it doesn't need to. And then says, sure, yeah, yeah, pop round in half an hour. I live at 101 Acacia Avenue. Oh, right, I thought you lived in Hampstead. No, 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 um, used to, just moved. Oh, right, okay. And then they come round, and they, you can, they're sort of slightly puzzled look as to, I thought this guy was really wealthy, and here I am in some two-bedroom apartment. And um, if the narcissist picks up on that, this quizzical look, what's the matter? Oh, I thought you lived in a huge mansion. But yes, it's being refurbished just here. This is my sister's right. place. And, so and John, another lie is told and another lie is told. Right. But the point is that the narcissism only deals with what's going on in the moment when it's a lesser or mid-range narcissist. So basically, tell a lie, you challenge the lie, they'll tell another lie to get out of the first right, lie. Right, right, right. And then... And then they'll create another problem. But basically, it's just kicking the can down the road the yeah, whole time. Yeah. And, and, and ultimately, if it gets to a point where that person clearly doesn't believe you, then either the narcissist will go on the attack and say, what's with all the questions? Is, is this a Spanish Inquisition? Why are you doing all of this? Or we'll just turn around and, and, and say, get out of my house. Nobody talks to me like that in my house. <laughs> and brings them and asserts control by bringing the conversation to an end. Or might even turn around and say, fuck you, I'm not being spoken to like this, and storms out of their own home, not thinking, hang on a minute, they've left that person in their house and walked off, because their narcissism isn't thinking about what's coming next, they're thinking I... about dealing with the point in the moment. Okay, it's you're probably familiar with the um, uh, comedy series The Inbetweeners? Yes. Uh, Jay, the compulsive bullshitter, who yes. makes uh, these extraordinary claims for himself all the time you know at one point they're talking yeah. about smoking weed you know they're of that yeah. age that people start doing that and he goes oh yeah you know I've got a dealer he can sort you out anytime and then it comes 
15 minutes later, they actually think, OK, right, Jay, you've got a dealer, haven't you? He says, oh, no, my, he's um, fucked off to Afghanistan on his gap year, you know. Yeah, and yeah. That kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, speaking of, did you, um, did you watch uh, the UK office, David Brent? Yes. What school is David Brent, if you, if you put him under the Tudor scope? Well, what you've got to be careful with, Harry, is that when you're dealing with on-screen individuals, of course, they are fictional, invariably based upon facets of other people. And what tends to happen is you very rarely get an absolute portrayal yeah. of an accurate narcissist or psychopath on television or in film. Why? Because it's unpalatable for audiences. And that the people that write these characters, they've got to have some form of redeeming characteristic about them. Okay. So, for instance, I often talk about, I think the, I think the film might have been called Identity Theft. Jason Bateman was in it, and I think Melissa McCarthy. And what she does is, is she steals other people's identity and then basically racks up loans, credit card debts for them. And she is a thoroughly unlikable, superficial uh, vacuous individual that's just motivated by cheap, garish stuff. She goes to a bar, buys everybody drinks, tries to get off with the nearest man, goes to prison for all of this when uh, Bateman's character tracks her down. But then in prison, she has a moment of redemption and realises the error of her ways right. and strikes up a lovely, lovely, glowing relationship. Now, to begin with, she was a pretty good depiction of an upper lesser type A narcissist, okay. quite charismatic, utterly superficial, not interested in anybody, and they're a, a somatic, driven by material things. But then all of a sudden, there's this huge injection of empathy at the end of the film. Yeah, yeah. So you, okay. so you, so with her, you'd say not a narcissist because empathy's thrown in. This section of the film, she is here. She's not. Okay. And that's not an accurate representation. With Brent, he, of course, is self-absorbed often fails to read the room, tells lies, thinks he's far more impressive than he actually is, but he's not actually that manipulative an individual. And he mm -hmm. comes across more as just essentially insecure. And he's always right. trying to curry favours. So uh, the, the chap who's the uh, comes in, uh, Ralph uh, Innocen plays him, I think, who always, uh, I can't remember the character's name, but he's the big salesman and, and Brent always toadies up to him and he's like, oh, he's in, yeah, he's one of the lads. Finchy, isn't it? Finchy, thank you, yeah. there we are. So he immediately sort of toadies up to him and shows that sort of insecurity that he has. And yes, he's a bullshitter and yes, he exaggerates and he competes uh, uh, with uh, the, the gentleman that comes from the other office. But again, there are moments where he does exhibit a degree of empathy so you wouldn't fit him into a classic portrayal okay. of a narcissist okay that's interesting right so i'm aware of the time so i want to get through some other questions mm -hmm. here's a good one didn't and there's a couple of questions in here so i'll just uh i'll just go for it one do narcissists ever have a sense of guilt or regret how would a nope. how would a narcissist react to being challenged perhaps by another narcissist has HG himself ever been in a narcissist verbal battle? If a narcissist is wanting to win a battle, how do you know you have won? And does a narcissist ever feel stupid if found out? I've repeatedly had involvements with other narcissists, uh, both in my private life and, of course, what I do in terms of interacting. So sometimes I've had narcissists come along for a consultation, but they don't necessarily, there's only been one that I can think of that sought to challenge me. And she kept trying to talk over me, so I just kept going until she shut up. So she backed down. Um, and in other instances, there are people who comment on my YouTube channel or my blog where I can see that they are narcissists. And in those instances, I will either just ignore them. So I've asserted control by staying in a position of withdrawal and deprive them of fuel and not give them the control over me that they seek. Or because I'm far more intelligent than they are and know my subject inside out, and they invariably are loose cannons, I shoot them down with logic, not because I know they'll accept it, because they won't, because their narcissism won't let them. I'm doing it to demonstrate to everybody else 
that I'm far more capable than this individual. So everybody else seeing this sparring going on will go, that's another round to HG. The, the punch drunk narcissist that's trying to argue with me just is rope-a-dope. They're just like, getting repeatedly pummeled by me. And eventually what they will do is they'll disappear. Whereas there are, that, that's them asserting control over me by withdrawing. But the fact that they've withdrawn tells me that I've got control. So what can happen is you can have a clash of two narcissists where they both actually gain control over the other mm. because of their relevant perspectives. I look at it and go, I gained control because you ran away from me because I logicked you into the ground with the force of my intellect. That's a win for the ultra. That lesser narcissist scurries away thinking, fuck him. And the fact that I've, t I, I, in my head, I thought that about HG Tudor and I'm not answering him, that means I've won. Now, objectively, people looking at that would go, no, you ran away, HG out argued you, he's won. But that doesn't matter because that narcissist in their world believes they've won and that's all that matters. Their narcissism tells them that they've won. If somebody came along and said to them, you lost because HG's arguments were far superior to yours, then he would just turn around and say to them, oh, you're one of HG's cult members. You're just with your tongue firmly wedged up HG's backside. I'm not listening to somebody like you. You're just biased. And then they convince themselves that they are correct again because that person has no validity because they're a flunky, a flying monkey of HG Tudor. <laughs> Thank you. Let me just have a check to see if there are any last minute questions. Uh... Oh, Carly got back to us. I suppose it was how does alcohol, what effect does alcohol have on the emotional sensitivity slash empathy levels of the narcissist? Well, a narcissist has no empathy. So alcohol doesn't affect the empathy level because there isn't any there. Mm -hmm. So alcohol is something whereby narcissism often lends itself to the abuse of alcohol because the narcissist has no sense of accountability so i'll drink and drive sense of entitlement i'll drink while i'm at work um lacks insight this isn't a problem for me to be drinking there's the narcissistic trait of selfish to uh, engage in that other people put second to the needs of the narcissist so again drinking whenever i want uh, so Drink doesn't act as a stressor upon the no. emotional empathy of a narcissist because there isn't any. But drink acts as, an, 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 as a stressor, an external stressor on anybody else who's not a narcissist who has yeah. emotional empathy. So what can happen is take an alcoholic and take a narcissist. They are actually quite, they look pretty similar. They're both deceitful about engaging in excessive drinking and they will both engage in narcissistic, not narcissist, but narcissistic behavior. They both lack insight into the fact that they've got a problem. They both will manipulate to get to where they want to. The narcissist manipulates to get the prime aims. The alcoholic will manipulate to get to the point of being able to drink. Both will tell lies about what they've been doing, where they've been, how much they've had to drink both act selfishly and so forth and so but what happens is that when the alcohol alcoholics not drinking their emotional empathy comes back when the narcissist isn't drinking there is no emotional empathy and then you start to see the distinctions i i was just about to say i think it's more interesting uh in the case of the person who isn't a narcissist when they're drinking heavily um i used to drink yeah. very heavily myself and i was far more impulsive than I am, far more recklessly self-centered, uh, mm -hmm. even vandalistic in some cases. But then mm -hmm. you know, uh, now I don't drink at all. I can't handle it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But mainly for that so, reason, so, because I don't like who I am when I'm um, drunk or high. Well, and the point is that when you recognize that, because you have emotional empathy for other people and the sense of accountability, you say, uh, the beast that I turn into when I've in, when I've taken excessive amounts of alcohol, I actually don't like that person. So I'm going to put a stop to it. So you show accountability by no longer engaging in that behaviour. A narcissist wouldn't. They might well say to somebody, "Oh, I can't stand the person I turn into when I had a drink," but then they go and do it again the following Saturday, and then the Saturday after that, and the Saturday after that, it's false contrition. Mm. 
Paul's contrition, right. So I can see everyone has lots of questions, but we're going to have to wrap it up there. Um, but by all means, subscribe to uh, HG Tudor's social media channels. I think sometimes you do live streams, don't you, HG, where people can ask I questions. certainly do. So if people uh, go across to HG Tudor, knowing the narcissist, the ultra, and subscribe and join the other 150,831 educated souls there, wow. then you'll get a notification when a live stream comes along and you can join in and question me till I burst. Wonderful. And I have to ask this very last question from someone. HG, yes. don't you ever get tired of being a narcissist? No. It's a common misconception that being a narcissist is exhausting. But go and ask the shark that swims in the sea if he gets tired of swimming around and eating things. And all he'll do is bite your arm off. Why? He's a shark. And that's what he's designed to do. We are designed to pursue the prime aims. Some narcissists will say, oh, it is awful being me. It is exhausting. Oh, I feel so terrible. I feel empty inside. That's not a genuine admission about being miserable. That's their narcissism causing them to give the appearance of being miserable in order to evoke a pity play and draw sympathy from you. Quite simply, it's great being me. I have no conscience, no remorse, no sense of guilt. I always drive forward. People get in my way, they get dealt with. It isn't exhausting. This is what I'm designed to do. Now, for other narcissists, they aren't as effective as the greater or the ultra. So their lives can be quite chaotic and they've got problems and they're haphazard. So you would look objectively and go, well, that's not a nice state of affairs that they're in. But they don't sit at home on their own and think, oh, this is my and, life. And they wouldn't really blame awful. And they wouldn't blame themselves. They blame everything else. Exactly. Yeah. So if you were to say to them, you, you, can't keep a, you can't keep a girlfriend, you're in and out of work, you, you, you keep getting kicked out by your landlords, you, you dress like you're stuck in the 1970s on a porn movie, and your hair's crap, the narcissist won't go, I know, my life's a real misery, I'm useless. They'll invariably go, why are you being so mean to me? And there's nothing wrong with what I'm wearing. This is very much... Uh, in at the moment and well my landlords I can't help it if I just always come across horrible landlords who've got it in for me and women well they're, snake, they're snakes with tits and I just can't help it I'm a nice guy but I just seem to keep getting falling foul of these harpies out there and as for my, my jobs I've told you before I couldn't help it they didn't instruct me that at dunking donuts I shouldn't be dunking certain things into the donuts they didn't train me properly it's their fault and that self-pitying narcissist will always reject any suggestion that any of their woes are down to them it's always somebody else's fault oh god you are something else